Hey, 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 what do you say? It is the Swipe It Show right here on the Success Network, of course. I'm Kevin Hodes, your host, and I'm the president and CEO of Swipe It, you know, that crazy credit card processing company all over the country. Every state in the union, I believe we are. I'm, I could probably check on that. We can. Do we have a fact checker? Maybe we should uh, check on that. I'm pretty sure we're everywhere. Uh, we actually, wait a minute, hold on. We're not in Alaska. I know we're not in Alaska. So, uh, and we're not in Puerto Rico. We're not in the Virgin Islands. So we're good there. But maybe we need to be in the Virgin Islands. So I can go for vacation there. But of course, if you are watching and you are enjoying the show, you need to like it. You know, uh, there's a little button down there somewhere that you should like it. You can share this for other people to be seeing as well. But we will be doing some other things after this that we'll put out. So little snippets of it. You can do recaps with those. But, of course, this is the Swipe It Show. And we're right here in beautiful Frisco, Texas, where it's getting ready to, I think it's going to be uh, a little rainy, maybe some hail today. So uh, the car is in the garage. But, of course, we've got a really, really special guest on the show i um, super, super excited because you may know him through some of the books that he's written. His best-selling book is called Never Split the Difference. Of course, uh, Mr. Chris Voss is, of course, a uh, best-selling author. What a great book right here. And, of course, I am very honored to be the executive producer of his life story and Brandon, his son, for – Tactical Empathy. Look at this. I made these little mini movie posters. Isn't that cool? I love this uh, little poster here. And, of course, Chris has been gracious enough to want to come on the Swipe It show. And we're going to bring Chris on here in three, two, one. Ryan, there we All go. Right. Good morning, Chris. How are you? Fantastic, Kevin. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for executive producing the documentary film much appreciated thank you no listen pleasure is all mine you know what's wonderful about being in these things that i do with uh, abundance films and the dna group these guys are doing things that help people and you know when you're helping people i love to be around people like that um, we've had extensive conversations about helping people and sometimes right. you don't make money off it it's not about the money it's about just helping and getting the message out to help other people be successful in whatever they're doing. And that's Amen. where, you know, you come into play. You're definitely one of those guys that is helping people, right? Yeah. Make it a world, a better place, brother. And we're, make it better for everybody. We're trying to make the world a better place. One crazy person at a time, right? <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. That's right. I want to make, everybody aware i'm doing something a little unorthodox typically we would do this at the a little end, but of course uh like that you're unorthodox in everything you do man how is anything <laughs> a little unorthodox well you know i i do these little little unorthodox things right like we have these little tactical empathy uh black swan pens and yeah, you know yeah. i i love drinking my coffee you know out of uh, my yeah. black swan cup <laughs> You know, hey, listen, you got to promote your friends, right? I don't even have one of those. I mean, I got I to gotta get one of those. What? I mean, even if you were drinking water out of it. Come on, Chris. I know, yeah, or scotch or anything. I know a guy. You know a guy, baby. <laughs> I, I know a guy. Uh, okay. I, I want to bring up and say, first and foremost, if you've never read the book, we're going to talk about some things in here a little bit and maybe something in the movie. But I, I want people to go out and buy this book. I, I really, th this is one of the best books that I have ever read. And it has techniques that you can use in your everyday life. You're never going to do everything in the book. Listen, when a, when a publisher publishes a cookbook, nobody does every recipe. They do one or two things in that book, and then they go back to it. They may try something and fail at it, but they always go back to what they know. So I'm suggesting, highly recommending this book. I'm disappointed that Chris didn't have me do the forward in it, but you know, we'll we'll wait for next the next one. But uh, obviously, I want you to check it out. Now, the other thing you may not know about is is there's an organization called the Black Swan Group, where 
Chris's son, Brandon, is the president of that organization, and he is an amazing individual that everybody needs to meet. So we're, we're going to talk about some stuff, but I really want people to know who you are if they don't know, and they can use this as a reference. The website is Black Swan, L as in Larry, T as in Tom, D as in David, dot com. And you can go to that while we're talking and listening. But I wanted to do that on the front side because a lot of times, even as world renowned that Chris is, he isn't as recognizable because you you may have never seen him. You've only seen the book. So anyways, I wanted to get that out, check it out, enjoy it. And then one day we'll we'll be out. We're, we're doing private screenings of this right now, which we'll talk about uh, soon as well. But hey, listen, Chris, uh, l- let me thank you so much for being on the Swipe It show. I really uh, enjoyed a lot of time you were here for my military appreciation night, which was awesome. I know Brandon could have make it. Um, he'll be here next year and maybe you will be too. So either way, you know, I, I love helping people. And as I'm reading through the book and all this stuff, but I've, I've got to ask you, you know, you grew up in Iowa and you were a police officer. Tell me how you transitioned from being and what created being a police officer transitioning to the FBI. Yeah, it was, um, it was really cool. It was uh, it was incredible learning, creating, starting over. Most FBI agents are second career professionals. Um, I, you know, I was a cop in Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri, very happy there. Uh, and simultaneously, my father encouraged me to go to federal law enforcement. I met a Secret Service agent who said he traveled all over the world with the service. And I'm like, wow, now that sounds like a cool job. I was in an assignment in Kansas City Police Department. I was getting a little bored with it at the time. And so I put in for the FBI and I got hired and sent to Quantico and my world expanded. Um, for me, it was a great move. I mean, it just had uh, the amount of opportunity um, to do good, to completely use a cliche, is an FBI agent is really there. You got to want to be in the big game. I ended up in the in the big game on a daily basis in New York and working with great people that wanted to make a difference. I really enjoyed my time there. It was so it was to me, it was a, a growth. It's about growth. I, you know, it, growth is important in everybody's life. And if you're not growing, you're probably going backwards and to go yeah. further in life, you need to go forward. So, you know, definitely growing is important and you've identified that you needed to move forward and you did that. Little question for you. Have you ever heard of a town called Kearney, Missouri? Do you remember? That rings a distant bell, but a really distant bell. Kearney, Missouri is the birthplace of Jesse James. Oh. It is a little tiny town that I went to elementary school for a few years because my mother still lives in Missouri, in outside of Kansas City. And I have a half brother who. Uh. He is in Kansas City working for a different company. But, you know, every time I hear you say Kansas City, I keep forgetting to mention to you that my mom lives out there. And my stepdad is uh, was a somebody that worked at TWA, the, you know, the 12 wobbly airplanes there that KCI. <laughs> yeah, they had a big operation in Kansas City. For <laughs> yeah. And then they got gobbled up by American. But, you know, when when you were obviously looking to grow yourself, you were transitioning from being a police officer, you know, how did, how did you actually get to hostage negotiation? Cause I know that was talked about in tactical right. empathy, which we haven't put out yet, but how did, how did you do that transition? What, how did that come about? Tell me that story. Yeah. Well, one of the bridges from the police department to the FBI was I was on a list to join the SWAT team with the police department. So I, I never actually got to the SWAT team, but I was on the list to go, you know, you, you apply, you track, you get interviewed, they rank you, you get on a list. I was on a list. Wow. And so then with the bureau, I joined the SWAT team. I got on the SWAT team. My first office was FBI Pittsburgh. And I got on the Pittsburgh SWAT team, went on a couple of operations, got transferred to New York. 
and decided I was going to try to attempt to try out for the FBI's hostage rescue team, which is the FBI's version of the Navy SEALs. This, you know, the, these guys, all they do is train and practice for tactical events. And I re-injured a knee and um, <laughs> had an ongoing problem with my right knee, which I still deal with today. You know, it helps keep doctors in uh, uh, fast cars, and big houses, <laughs> a long-term injury. And um, knew that I wanted to stay in crisis response. I like, I like it when people have to make decisions. Procrastination is sort of the bane of my existence. You know, the risks and costs of comfortable inaction, as Kennedy said, far outweigh the costs of making mistakes. That's a clear paraphrase. Wow. But, you know, the hostage negotiators went out with the SWAT guys. I didn't really know what they did, but, you know, didn't look hard. How hard could it be? I talk to people every day. And uh, it's far more complex than that. But when I got into it and I got trained, I loved it. It was more satisfying than being on SWAT ever was. And I love SWAT. So I was, you know, I was, I think I was wired to become a negotiator. And fate took me in that direction. That's awesome. I, you know, you, you may, when you say the word SWAT, it makes me think of the TV show. Remember that TV show? SWAT. You know, yeah. how realistic really was that, right? You know, or was it just made for TV? Yeah, a little overblown. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they get out there and they do the stuff. They don't, just don't do it as often. Uh, it's, there's a lot of artistic license <laughs> on the television. Yeah, show. of course, right? It's got to have drama. It's got to have some, you know, ways to keep you engaged and things of that nature. Uh, you know, the the one thing that really is amazing with you, Chris, is it's, it's a, it, you're a fascinating man and you fascinate me right. in a very unique way, which makes me think like when I was reading the book of things that I've done in the past in my career. So I, I don't know if that's the correct way I'm supposed to be looking and thinking of things when I'm reading the book, but you have created the fascination of how did I accomplish that? And what I think is fascinating about you is that in the book, you teach people these different techniques and those different techniques that you're teaching them, they are trying to negotiate or figure out ways to make things in their advantage, obviously, because um, we, we don't want to split the difference, right? We, we, we never, we, never, never, never want to split the difference. And the the fascinating part is, is it made me think of when I was uh, working for this company that I would show up and you talk about this further into the book about, you know, the leverage part of it. I would show up at a business owner and I would show them how to confidentially find a buyer for their business. I would spend four hours, four hours, I would do a business evaluation I would tell them how much their business would worth, and I would collect anywhere from seven to ten thousand dollars from them. I would then take a piece of paper, have them sign it, and then I would take that piece of paper to their bank and have them create it as a cashier's note. So the the complex, and I made great money from that, and I would do it three, four, five times a week, and it was crazy. I was doing it around five states. So while I was reading the book, I was thinking about. I'm already doing a lot of these mirroring, labeling, accusation, whatever I was using. And you kind of put it in the book. And I'm like, does this man know my mind? How did he do that? Right. So I want to talk about how people that are in business, they need to utilize certain techniques. And I, they obviously don't have four hours like I did. I wasn't traveling so far away. But you use labeling. Explain labeling of how it could be utilized in a business setting. Yeah, you know, and I, and I love what you're talking about because what we're talking about is applied emotional intelligence. And as a successful business person and somebody who loves to learn, like you're a naturally curious dude. Curiosity is a superpower. I mean, that starts to ramp up your uh, learning and then also get you better at emotional intelligence. And this is, this is applied emotional intelligence. Like all education is a result of experience. What's the mechanism that we can identify to shorten everybody's learning curve. 
So one of those that you just talked about is labels. Uh, labels, just a verbal observation. Uh, hanging a label on an emotion or a dynamic or an instinct, a feeling that you have in a moment. Now, how do you ha hang a label on it? You say, seems like something's holding you back. Like if somebody, you ask somebody a question, you know, you make the mistake of going for yes. And they go, yes. Now, people that aren't really <laughs> listening or applying their emotional intelligence, they're going to be like, woohoo, I just got a yes. But if your emotional intelligence is high, you sense that something's holding them back. And it's really important for you to have a long-term relationship. And you got to show them that they can trust you. So instead of leaping all over that yes, you know, you say something like, it seems like something's holding you back. And the trust is built through the roof. Like they trust you. And then consequently, saying it like that, you found through trial and error, and so did we. That's how we came upon this, through hostage negotiation, crisis intervention. People are more likely to give you the unvarnished truth. This is instead of thinking about an answer and constructing an answer, you want the real answer with all of its warts and ugliness and good and bad. You want the real answer because that's how you create a great relationship and move forward together and people trust you. Trust is the way to a person's pocketbook or pocket, right? You know, and, and you're yeah. not, no one's deceptive in their tactics. They're just utilizing psychological tools that you can teach them to get the things that they don't realize they need. And I find that business owners, they, they are, they always want to know ways to do things. They just don't know how a fresh perspective can help them get what they want. And that's where, you know, like in the book, they, they need people that come in and use psychological tactics to help them grow their business. And I know that with me, I'm, I do a lot of mirroring and, and I love the fact that when I, you know, it reinforces something in their brain. And I don't remember where I saw it. You you said, um, oh gosh, what was it? Something in our brain starts with an M. Mel melanone. Oh, what was that word? Uh, well, there's mirror neurons. There we and... go. Yes, yes. And and you mentioned that. Go. Can you talk about what that is from negotiation style? What what does that really mean to somebody that doesn't know what that is? All right. And so then I'm happy to talk about mirror neurons from a layman's perspective. And, you know, the neuroscientists are going to say, you know, there's no such thing as mirror neurons. What there is is an emotional resonance circuitry that we haven't identified. Like, I don't care what you call it. You know, but what it is, is in your affect um, being the lead because the other person, there's a, uh, they're going to, they're going to, calm is contagious. So the mirror neurons pick up calm and it helps make people calm. Okay enthusiasm is contagious you know a smile is contagious a smile in your voice is contagious you know it's hitting the circuits in the other person's brain and it tends to lead them in that direction and you know that's a real distinction that i would make um from many approaches uh out there very much and and i'll cite one guy i've read his book uh the way of the wolf jordan belfort the wolf of wall street extremely okay. successful guy i've been on his I've been interviewed by him and Jordan talks about, he learned that like if somebody's upset and angry, you match them and then they see that you're like them and then you start to calm down and you can bring them down. And I a hundred percent agree with everything, but the first step, like if they're angry, you can you let calm is contagious. You know, he is, I think, uh, his real effectiveness is a second step forward. And you don't need to match. As a matter of fact, I think it's a bad idea to match somebody's anger, but everything else that he would lay out there because of the mirror neurons is one of the reasons why the guy was so effective. You know, he had a natural gut instinct. He got taught certain things and I would employ many of the same mechanisms for, uh, for productive, positive outcomes. So yeah, mirror neurons, calm is contagious. Enthusiasm is contagious. Anger is contagious, and that's why, you know, we don't recommend people uh, take uh, adopt become the second mover and it, uh, is angry when somebody else is angry. Just go ahead and be calm, or go ahead and be reassuring. 
and it'll have the impact you want because of the thing we're discussing right now, the mirror neurons. Absolutely. And I, I literally just, I got back on Saturday. We were filming up in Nashville and I had to see a client, I had a meeting. I, I went there and one of their staff members was so angry about this one aspect. And I had to literally bring, you know, I'm typically in a meeting and I was, I'm usually pretty calm. I'm always uh, assertive and making sure that I'm being respectful, but I literally had to, the, the owner was standing to the right and this person over here was just so angry about stuff. And they were kind of angry more at the owner. So I was able to help diffuse the situation a little bit. And I go, listen, don't pay attention to that. You just need to do this and then understand this. And that will solve that issue because they just kept going on and on and on because it was an analytical owner who was more of an engineer type that, you know, they can be very analytical and that right. person just didn't understand. So I had to kind of step in and, uh, and then I had a, and I'm, I'm re I'm replaying it in my brain. And then I, you know, what we need to do now is just do this, this, and this. And I laid it out and she goes, well, that makes sense. So it was a really perfect situation where you, you have to be very careful. And I believe that you also have to, know who you're talking to, know when to step into certain situations and know when to step away from them. Cause that's a little knack in itself. And I think that, um, you do that in when you were doing hostage negotiation, because what you say can actually hurt people, right? You know, depending on certain situations, somebody can lose their life. And what you're trying to do is get them to understand that, you know, in, in certain, Oh my God, I can't believe it. Like, like I said, listen, my mom is called. I, I, awesome. I, I, you can't I, take that. Take mom. Let, let's see what happens. I, I didn't make this up. I Ready, watch this. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see what she says. Hello. Hey, mom. How are you? Oh, I'm okay. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm in the middle of doing my podcast show, mom. Well, that's okay. I just want to say hi, see how everyone is. Yes, I'm, I'm I'm talking to a former Kansas City police officer. Okay, I'll let you go. All right, Mom, I love you. Talk to you later. Love you too. Bye. Bye now. I, you know, I, I love mean, your mom's voice. Your mom is, what a sweetheart of a human being. That was really cool. I'm going to tell you that I've said to Ryan, my mom's going to call one time during a show and I'm just going to answer it. So Got to answer. Yeah. I think it's, it, you know, it's funny. She's, she's getting up in age and I'm her, her 80th birthday is coming up at the end of the month and I'm going to go and uh, visit her. Nice. And uh, you know, she's, she's just there in the middle of nowhere and, in Kansas city, right. You know, you've been there, you've lived there, but, uh, I want to go back to what I was, was going into and, you know, what I was kind of leading towards was there is, there's a, uh, a knack to doing specific things, right. And you have to be able to know when to get in or get out or make adjustments and they're critical. Otherwise you could look really kind of foolish. Right. So I know that like, Brandon, your son, he, he is, you, you once said something that was intriguing to me and you said, I don't remember where you said it, where we were, but you said that Brandon actually absorbed information from you and it, and it hit home with me. I don't remember where or when, or maybe you say it often, but you, I, I was obviously there. And I'm going to tell you why it's so important, because um, as the lighting went off here in the office, of course, that's always, always fun when it doesn't, you know, I'm a small guy behind this big, huge thing going here. I thought maybe the SWAT team was coming in, you know, yes, not they were coming in. For you, eh? Well, I got to run to the shredder first. Okay. <laughs> okay. The shredder's where you go when you've got a problem, right? Yeah. First thing you do is just shred everything. So with, with Brandon, he grew up around you and he, osmosisly you know he picked up all this stuff from you and that's why he is such an awesome dude he uh, he he literally has created his future from you being this guy that has all this knowledge he absorbed and he applies it 
And I've had that same situation with my father being a corrections officer. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and you, you did SWAT. My father was part of the orange crush as they call them or mm -hmm. the cert team, the correctional emergency re response team. So he would go in and he had to do some little bit of hostage negotiations. He had to do a little bit of, you know, trying to defuse situations. And I kind of learned that. And I think it made me kind of the person I am. But, you know, when it made Brandon the person he is, right, it gave you the ability to feel really confident in his abilities with the Swan Group. Tell me a little bit more how the Swan Group helps, helps people these days because he's – Black Swan. Uh, I'm sorry? Black Swan, not the Swan. The, Black um, Swan. Yeah, I'm sorry. The Black Swan Group. Yeah, I mean, come on. I drink – you know what the problem is? I don't read it. <laughs> I can't see it. It's an advertisement. It's not a reminder. Yeah. So the Black Swan Group, tell me how how that came about and how, you know, Brandon's doing an amazing job, but I'll let you take the floor on that one. Well, I yeah. People need to know. You, you want to go fast, go low, and you want to go far, go as a team. I mean, Brandon was the original member of my team coming out and his, his uh, immersion in the skills was such that like he knows his stuff. I mean, he's. Uh, I got. I got asked the other day who's the best negotiator I know, and I said Brain of Voss. And I was thinking about that afterwards. Like the, number one, that's true. Number two, how does that happen? Well, you know, through through our growth phases, when our neuroplasticity and our our, our learning is at its highest, you know, he got exposed to stuff. Like he was figuring it out. I had no idea how he was absorbing it. And, and of course, you know, they talk about prodigies. They just got interested before anybody else noticed. You know, they got their 10,000 hours in by the time they were eight years old. I mean, he, he got his hours in like really early. Also, it a, through periods of time in any human being's life when their brain absorbs the most. It's the most, they're the most present. Uh, they have the most neuroplasticity. They're borderline flow all the time. Stephen Kotler would, would, would tell you that adolescents are all in borderline flow, which is where your learning is at the highest. So he understands it so well that when it uh, came time to start to build the company and I, uh, I was in it by myself for a very short period of time, but he was always there helping. He was always a sounding board at all times. And then we had a, uh, we had a contract back in 2009, which turned into be just a bit of a train wreck. And I needed somebody's help that I could trust. And he was always there and always building the ideas and refining them. You know, brought him into the company and we navigated some rough waters that I never would have gotten through without. Like you would have no idea who I am if uh, Brandon Voss had not been my partner. No, I can I can really see that. He literally, I think he stayed with, um, didn't he stay with Roz? Um, Tall Roz? Oh, yeah. Well, Tall came and stayed with him. Gotcha. You know, and, tall, and, tall came down from New York, Tall Roz, our co-author, and stayed at Brandon's house. And then we went through interviews and talked and talked and talked. Brandon was there every moment. Um, I wasn't even there every moment. Like we one night we had to, I had to go to a meeting and Tall went to the meeting with us. And uh, Brandon and Tall sat at the bar and talked while I was in a meeting. So, yeah, tall, tall came down and got immersed, got exposed more to Brandon than he got exposed to me in terms of hours then. And he immersed all that information. He was able to help with creating the book itself. So that's, uh, you know, it's totally awesome. It gives the ability for people to really have a deeper understanding from even a third person. But that third person is family anyways. And, yeah, course, and I got I to gotta throw a side shout out for Tal Ross. Tal Ross a genius. Like in, in, in working with other writers, you know, the, the other book behind me, the full fee agent for residential real estate agents. Like I came to understand just how good tall Roz was. I mean, like I thought we were getting a writer and we got a writer and a researcher and a thinker and just it's brilliant mind, but, and a brilliant writer. So yeah, tall was great. Tall the book, the book is one of a kind because of him. You know, the, the books are, are, are fantastic. I think you have three books, right? You've done three books? Well, uh, you know, the, there was a minor book uh, a, a number of years back uh, that's attributed to me. You know, 
principally, and we've got a couple of books in the works. But, we do. Uh, you know, so far it's uh, it's it's the two. I'm I'm excited for the next one of the next books because I'm a co-author of that book as well. So I'm really excited about that. That's going to be cool. It's a yeah, a lot of good projects coming down the pike. A lot, a lot of and, good stuff. More everything involved with you is fun. That's well, what I love about it. It's always fun. I mean, life is about being in the moment, but you got to have fun. You know why not? Why not? It's it's it, life is should be exciting and impactful and resourceful, right? You know, you yeah. you could spend your life just you know sitting behind a desk all day and never have any fun, but you got to get out and see some. You know, and maybe smile a little bit, right? We were talking about smiling before. I try to give a smile to the people at the checkout counter. You know, you smiling is the most contagious thing on the planet. You don't even have to yeah. say anything. It's just a yeah. body function of just smiling, and it is amazing. You, we used to tell people in our boiler room when I when I was doing that crazy stuff. You know, smiling is dialing, and you would be smiling all the way through phone calls, and people can feel the energy. Yep. And it was very helpful. I want to talk about this is one of my favorite things is beware of yes, master, no, yes. because I know that if you can get people to say no before they say no, it's done. The no is out of the way. Tell me more about yes and no and how it helped you in your career. And the reason for that is that when people say no, they feel safe and protected. Both of these words, like any aspect of the communication, there's a difference between hearing it and saying it like we hate hearing no normally until we understand what a mechanism it is for acceleration um but people love saying it you know i've i've heard people talk about you know the other side we can't get an agreement they're in no mode they say no to everything and my response is that change your questions and they're like nah i can't be it like, yeah it is it because when people say yes, they wonder where the commitment is. We love to hear yes, but what does it happen when you say yes? There hasn't been a single group that I've spoken to out there anywhere when I've said, when a voice on the other end of the phone says, have you got a few minutes to talk? What's your gut reaction? Because they're trying to get a yes out of you. And like universally, the whole group goes, they'll either say no or they'll go silent because they know there's a fear there. Somebody's trying to get me to say, yes, where's this going? What's this let me in, in for? Like, I've, I've never had, and, and I probably asked this question of 10,000 people, no joke, literally. And I've never had anybody jump up and go, yes, I love saying <laughs> yes. Makes me happy to say yes. Yeah. That yeah. just never happens. So the difference is, what is it to say it? And what is it to hear it? And I would offer that when, it's not that you're getting no out of the way when you get a no before you get a no, a rejection. It's that you're making them feel safe and comfortable and protected. People feel protected when they say no. Having felt protected, they're less worried about the trap. So now they're listening. Like it, it, when Brandon was 17, uh, the parent of every teenager can relate. You hear the words, dad, can I, and you say no, before they even finish the sentence. And I look back at that and I realized that every time I said no, then I would hesitate for a moment. And then I go, all right, so what was it that you wanted? Because I felt safe and protected by having to say no. And that, that's really the understanding of the emotional dynamic. So make people feel safe and protected. It accelerates the deal. Exactly. You know, making people safe and protected is really the same thing as liking and trusting, right? So we, mm -hmm. we try to, in the, in the world of sales, we want people to like and trust us because they'll even, you know, even pay more if they like and trust, not to say people should pay more for anything. It's just that it's easier to make sales if people like and trust you. And, you know, typically like in this, in a sales environment, and this is where negotiation comes into play, uh, you know, let's let's just use a, a car salesman, for example. You know, car, car salesmen are the, the biggest reason salespeople at a car dealership don't make sales is because they never ask for the sale. They have they just ramble on. They keep going. They keep going. They're waiting for somebody to say, yes, I'm ready to buy. 
they've got to do some things to psychologically get them to say, yes, I'm ready to move forward. And they have to master certain techniques before they do that. And I've found that I, I use this all the time. Like, I'm going to ask you this. Uh, I go to Best Buy, and I don't know if you know this or not, and they're not going to like that I say this, but when you're at Best Buy, you can literally negotiate anything that's in that store. You can say, hey, listen, you know, is there a better deal maybe on this product? Oh, let me see. Because you don't get if you don't ask, right? Right. So my question to you is going back to more of a personal level. If you were literally at a car dealer, if you're you're negotiating for cars, you're negotiating for, uh, you know, big screen TV, maybe. Obviously, we know you've done uh, air, airline stuff and getting better deals there. But what is it you love to negotiate more than anything? You know, what's that one thing that you have you you yourself know is like I and it's not to get over anybody. It's just part of the art of the, the sale, right? Yeah, wow. Um, so like, I mean, I enjoy interactions with people so much that to talk about anything that I enjoy more than anything else would be really tough because <laughs> like when you get into this, um, you know, it becomes a language, sort of a secret language that you speak that makes you happier and also makes the people that you interact with happy. Yeah. So like, I, I'm I'm in some, some restaurant the other night. I know I'm going to be a pain in the neck for the waiter. I don't want that to be a bad experience for him. Right. You know, so he's like, uh, you know, waiter gets me a scotch. And it, you know, it, it's a, an exact pour, which means there ain't that much in there. You know, they measure out exactly a shot. And so the next one I order, I mean, I'm, I want more, but it ain't the waiter's fault, but it's the waiter's job to be my emissary. So how do I get my, the waiter to be my emissary when a bartender doesn't care on the impact of the waiter's tip because he's giving me a light pour? Very true. So, you know, I'm going to negotiate a better pour and I'm going to say, and how's, how's the waiter going to react? He's going to think I'm a pain in the neck. So I go like, I look at the dude and I go like, look, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be the worst customer you ever met. I mean, I'm, I'm getting ready to be a pain in the neck. I'm going to be horrible. And he's kind of bracing himself. And uh, he's like, okay, what is it? And I go, and the next scotch asks the bartender to pour it like he actually likes me. And so then I throw some humor in there. The guy laughs and he's happy, you know, and he thinks this guy's going to be fun to interact with. And, you know, I don't know what he said to the bartender, but he, the next scotch he comes out with, it's like a, it, it's it's a New York poor it makes me very happy. And and so I like that interaction because of all the people this guy's run around handling tables, you know, he sees most of the rest of the people <clears throat> as demanding or annoying or hard to please. And I am all of those things. And he's having a great time talking with me. This yep. is a table that he enjoyed talking to the whole time. Yep. So even if I don't get a better poor. You know, I want the waiter paying attention to me. I don't want it to be a painful interaction for for him or her. Her, and so I love all of this. I mean, I like doing it all. Yeah, no, it's really a good answer. I kind of put you on the spot there for different things, but that's a good example because what the the actual waiter doesn't realize is his job moving forward is going to be better because you pointed something out to him that he wasn't really thinking about maybe as often as he should. And now he will make sure for the next customer. So you just did that restaurant and that guy a service. Kudos to you. I like it. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's not that we want to be a pain in the ass when we're talking to people. We just, we want them to realize that sometimes, you know, there's a little mistake here. We'll just, you know, don't worry about it. And then you get everybody happy and everybody's cordial and it works out. I want to ask you um, something here to explain that I wrote down and I'm going to read it word for word. And it's, I want you to explain he, who, uh, excuse me. He who has learned to disagree without being disagreeable has discovered the most valuable secret of negotiation. Can you explain that for people that are watching and listening? Yeah. And it's a hard thing to do to be, to disagree without being disagreeable. And it's not this nonsense. Let's agree to disagree. Like, I, no, 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 no. 
but you got you got another you got a comparison point of view and so if someone's disagreeing with you they're probably triggering you and if you disagree with somebody else you're going to trigger them mostly in the way that we present it you know and even even the most innocuous and worst common ways is say somebody well why do you want that or why do you see it that way or or you know to ask why like why is that is a buried accusation and i love the fact that there's competitors out there teaching communication and say get to the why you know find out somebody's why because why is a trigger word man and the black swan group is always going to have the competitive edge if you know if you just stop asking people their whys now you do need to know their motivations but the ways to get it out of them without triggering them and you know you might disagree and you're trying to be nice and you just go like why do you want that uh that's a precursor to you somebody telling you that you're wrong you know somebody asks you why you want something why you did something doesn't matter what kind of tone of voice they use we have learned that this is a precursor to somebody disagreeing with us and we're triggered or accusing us or judging us so how do you get out of that what are the what are the subtle little ways of getting out of that the first one on the why question instead of saying why did you do that or why do you want that or why is that position change your why to a what like what causes that to be your position takes the sting of accusation out of it takes you in a step of being of disagreeing without being disagreeable yeah no it's 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 amazing how when you realize what it really means how it's going to help you move forward in your own life because people just don't pay attention to the details and this detail will obviously make their life a little simpler and it, it it's the book is is fascinating you know it, it is one of those books that you could probably read two and three times and still pick up something that you missed the first time you read it and that's why it's been on the bestseller list for what five years now it it hit number one in business negotiation shortly after we published it in 2016 and it is still there it is amazing it's and and you know you you may think that you yourself like i i feel i'm i don't feel i'm a very special person and i'm sure that maybe you don't feel that you're a special person but I see we, myself as a very average dude. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do too. And what is interesting is, is that we are, we, we take what we do or what you do and it it's natural. And we have just like, if you, if you talk to Serena or Venus, these unbelievable tennis players, it, they, they don't think they're special. They, they just think they have honed their craft. And, you know, people want to be around people that have honed their craft and it, it, it just becomes natural. And that's why the Black Swan Group, you have honed your craft and you're part of a circle of people that have been able to teach principles and procedures to get people to the next level in their life if they apply yeah. them. Tell yeah. us some things in that organizations meetings that you're trying to find from these business owners that will lead them to a path of excellence yeah and and i love the way that you put it like that because um you know you should strive for excellence not perfection and a lot of people mix those two things up or yeah. if they say well perfection is a fool's errand then they stop striving for excellence i mean excellence uh makes mistakes excellence does things bad you know but excellence is 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 an ongoing learning because it then becomes just a lot of fun so we're you know you're curious about what's coming at you you want to understand how things tick i think the big advantage of thinking yourself of yourself as an average dude you know average you know schmuck average joe is um you can learn from everybody like there isn't anybody out there that you can't learn from like i learned from jordan belfort i learned from a pittsburgh drug dealer I learned at the suicide hotline. Like I, 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 there isn't anybody that I'm afraid to learn from, even if they, and I'm not saying that any of the people that I've cited are, are negatively, uh, are despicable in any way, but you know, heck, I mean, I could learn from anybody if they're effective. I want, I want to know how they're effective. Do I adopt their morals? No, 
but do I want to learn how the mechanisms that make a life better? I'm way into that. And I'm way into helping other people put their kids in a better house, put their kids in a better school. Prosperity uh, goes all the way around. Yeah, I, I want to get in their pocket, but as a reward for having given them something that's far more valuable than what they gave me monetarily. You know, um, it is an abundant world if you take that attitude and you can help a lot of people have better lives. And you are helping people with better lives. There is no question. There are so many people that would say, I read that book and it truly helped me be a better person. And I can tell you, I feel that way. Uh, I, I can't say that a lot about things that I do, but it, it's made me a better person. And I appreciate that. And I thank you for that. I really do. From the bottom of my heart, you know, there's times when I, I need to suck it up and go, listen, I read this and it was amazing. And I'm telling others. So, you know, it, it helps everybody, right? Well, and the, the key there is you care about being a better person. Like some people don't. Like they're so resentful. You don't have to be sociopathic to not care about being a better person. You just be caught up in resentment and think that the world is scarce. And it is not. Right. right. But when you care about being a better person, the life gets better. Yeah. And you're happier. 100%. 100%. Well, we want to kind of wrap things up, but I wanted to let people know that obviously the movie, movie Tactical Empathy is going to be coming out and we're going to put it to the masses so everybody can see it. But we're doing some, some private showings that I think you and I talked about and the team, we've been talking with them. We've got to come up with some dates and I want people to know that we're going to put it together so that they can come and have potentially a question and answer after we show it. And we'll probably do that here in DFW and we might do it in some other cities because I pretty much hammered this out. I think we just need to get some dates and we'll talk more about that. But uh, are you ready to literally open up for the ability for Kevin and his craziness to help you grow the Black Swan Group? That's Amen. the real question. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would yeah, say, I want to uh, collaborate for all the stuff we've been talking about. You take phone calls from your mom, for God's sake. <laughs> Listen, there, I try to take every call, but unfortunately, there's a lot of scammers out there, and you know, they just waste our time. But at the end of the day, you got to take your mom's call, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what? And, and, I'll, and I'll throw a quick story at you along those lines because um, I started collaborating with some people over at uh, WME, the talent agency out of uh, Los Angeles. It's it's um, pioneered run guided by Ari Emanuel. And one of the guys um, that I was talking to, we were sitting down talking and he was telling me why, I like, why he loves working for Ari Emanuel and uh, Amir. And uh, Amir said that there was a rule if you're on Ari's team as to when to return phone calls, when to take them or return. He said the, the first priority is family. And he's like, I want to work for a guy whose first priority is family. And that's cool. Yep. No, I am. I'm all about family. I'm all about, obviously, friends and family. And, you know, you got to have priorities in life. You know, we only live once. And while we're here, we're trying to help people through that process. I love having the ability to help people. I love that you have taken the opportunity to be with me on the podcast today, the old Swipe It show. We're going to uh, look to wrap things up. And, you know, Chris has been an amazing person. The Black Swan Group. I'm so excited to be helping you folks in many different arenas because obviously on my business side, we can help clean up some things there as well. But what's okay. important for everybody to know is to get a chance, pick up the book, read it, enjoy it, read it again. You're going to you're going to love it. And then when we get the movies, we can, you know, the movie, it'll eventually be out. But what's important is, is for people to know that you're not you're not actually by yourself in life and you can learn from experts to help you get where you want to go. And I love Nick and his team and how they've affected my life. And it's given me the ability to do things I've never been able to do. And, uh, one of those is meeting Brandon through you and, and you, of course, you know, I, I say Brandon, but you know, it's, it's a family affair and, and everything I do is about helping others. 
I love what I do. This is obviously the Swipe It Show on the Success Network. Thank you so much until our next show. Brian, take us out.